Uh, hi, Ron. Hi, Matt. How's it going? Not bad, not bad. Um, so we should introduce ourselves briefly, I guess. We should, we should. I am uh, Matthew Glacius, Associate Editor at The Atlantic, and uh, you are, are Rihan Salam, also an Associate Editor at The Atlantic. Indeed, we are much like twins, except that I am a diminutive uh, and a rich chocolate brown, whereas you are uh, are enormous, uh, enormous man. You're kind of like a mountain of a man. I think of you as much like Zeus, the yes, Zeus of like the blogosphere. And, and pale. Very pale. Well, pale, but it's sort of with a kind of Cuban flavor, which is... Uh, I, 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 I hope to, to recapture some of that flavor, uh, <laughs> you know, one of these days. So we're here not just for uh, sort of the kind of uh, kibitzing that we, we normally do in your office when I kind of hover and, and I kind of glower, but we're here to actually discuss what is, in my view, the most important book written in a generation uh, and possibly in the entire <laughs> geological era, uh, since, which is since Heads in the Sand. It's... Uh, Heads in the sand. You can you can see it here, covering my face. Um, is that a, is that an ostrich? I mean, the the man over there, because that is quite a you know quite a fascinating neck. He's got. He, he yes, he's he's an ostrich man, a, a human animal chimera of the sort that the president warned us against in oh, his two thousand five State of the Union address. We need to get the bioethics uh, SWAT team in here. To the the council, this. Leon Cass, will uh, will stop it. Um, heads in the sand being, of course, an analogy of some kind. <laughs> Um, wrapped in a pun. Um, <laughs> our, our, our mutual friend, Julian Sanchez, I believe, came up with this title while, while he was drunk at the Raven. Um, but he has since disavowed it. So now Which is a source of, of many sort of wonderful foreign policy notions, including the uh, source of Soviet conduct written by George Kennan, in fact, written while drunk. <laughs> while drunk. Uh, the long telegram. Well, you know, because he, he actually wrote that from Russia, right? <laughs> and if you've well, ever been true, to yeah. Russia, it's, it's not possible to be sober there. <laughs> Well, it is very cold. I mean, you know, you have to give him that. So, you know, this isn't just any book. This is a book uh, that really is essential reading for anyone who cares about the fate of America and uh, the globe. It is about uh, American foreign policy in a dark and dangerous age. Uh, uh, tell yes. us a little, give some scene setting, Matt. Sure, sure. Well, you know, this uh, the, the genesis for this book came, I think, in, in 2005, as I've been following foreign policy issues at the American Prospect, and um, there was, a, a, you know, a, a one line of thought that said, well, you know, Democrats need to do, you, you know, this or that, abortion, something like that, and other people who... I think more correctly, we're looking at, at foreign policy issues, and we're looking at the fact that you know it was very frustrating for people who who were not Republicans and who are not conservatives to look at the success, the political success George W. Bush had had with the national security issue, while at the same time we had found this aspect of his legacy in Iraq, in particular, to be sort of the most you know infuriating and, and wrongheaded thing he'd done, and it was almost staggering that you could invade a country because you know it's it's nuclear weapons program was supposed to pose a threat to the United States, and then there just was no nuclear weapons program, and you win election anyway, and not despite the, the security issue, but largely because of it. So there was a very, I think, a conventional diagnosis of this problem, which said, you know, well, Democrats, Democrats need to get tougher. Um, and, you know, what that meant exactly, uh, you know, meant different things to different people. I tend to think it, it actually got a little vacuous. Um, but the argument I try to make in my book is is a different one, and to say that, that no, that actually um, Democrats had gotten too close to the same kind of principles that had animated the Bush administration and really became unable to tell a coherent story about, you know, why things had gone wrong and why they had a superior alternative, that you saw the bulk of the leaders of the party, in particular, endorsing the decision to invade Iraq, and then instead of admitting that they that they got this wrong and that, you know, there were poor strategic precepts here. They came up with a, a lot of, I think, fundamentally unconvincing sort of criticisms of, of the administration's conduct, a sort of kitchen sink type approach that lacked any kind of principled basis and lacked any kind of real coherence that would let them let them deal with the issues and convince anyone that, you know, there was a, a better way to go. Well, to what extent, I mean, you you talk about the distinctions among liberal hawks, mm -hmm. uh, I think very articulately and very persuasively, but, you know, spin that out for me a little bit, if you don't mind. I mean, to what extent was this simple opportunism, and to what extent was this, you know, a matter of, you know, Democrats, including elected officeholders, as well as, you know, 
left intellectuals mm -hmm. believing that actually this was an effective lever for progressive change in the wider right. world. Right. You know, I mean, I, I try to say in, in the book that there's a, a mix of considerations, that I think there's a, a lot of political opportunism involved, but also a lot of genuine sentiment of, of really two different kinds. I mean, there was some real thought by, you know, people who are in the Democratic Party that it, that Bush's argument, you know, was roughly correct. The original argument Bush made, that there was a direct national security threat emanating from Iraqi WMD research. Uh, and Ken Pollock played a very important Ken, 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 Yeah, I mean, I mean Ken, Ken Pollock was sort of the, the primary uh, exponent of that from a, from a non-administration perspective. Then there was also a lot of se sentiment, primarily among intellectuals, I think, rather than real policymaking practitioners, that this was going to be a sort of a, a great way to spread freedom and light throughout the world. And, and you also saw political opportunism. I mean, I think if you look at the breakdown of the congressional votes, for example, it, it's hard to deny that, as tends to happen in Congress, that, you know, pretty narrow political considerations were carrying a lot of weight over there. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, a, a lot of people who didn't have... A, any particular political dog in the fight, you know, went in this direction. And, and as I also say, I mean, there's a symbiotic relationship between these things. The kinds of people who, you know, want to get jobs and stuff in, in future administrations don't like to attack the leaders of their own party and, and vice versa. And people have a way, I think, of convincing... Of justifying, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, of, of convincing themselves that the thing that they think they need to do is, is also the right thing to do. Um... You know, I mean, I mean, one thing I go through in, in detail in the book is that in all throughout 2002, you had a lot of sort of people in a in a yes but camp on Iraq, yeah, saying you know there's there's a lot of merits here, but really to do this right, and then there would be sort of a list of things that you know you could know perfectly well weren't going to happen in part because you know it was just impossible, but people were sort of you know, wanted to say, well, they were on board the train, uh, on board the bus, say, backseat driving. Well, this is your very kind of getting a well regarded position. idea of the incompetence dodge, the idea that sort of this argument was a senseless argument given that actually there was no realistic way, you know, you had a clear expectation of what the military was capable of accomplishing, realistically speaking, and also what the Bush administration was likely to press for. Is that a fair characterization? Right. I mean, I mean, the, the incompetence dodge concept is something, uh, you know, I, I've been uh, working with as, you know, as, as the war turns south, a lot of people, particularly people who were liberals, who had supported it, um, you know, wanted to sort of get indignant and, and be super critical of the administration, and but also avoid any sort of blame for themselves. Without and acknowledging so, their complicity in sort of the... Policy. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so what they wanted to, to, tended to want to say was that the Bush administration had engaged in some kind of incomprehensible, you know, gap. That, that this all could have gone great, but the Bush administration, in an unpredictable way, had kind of handed policy over to, to hacks and incompetence, and that's why things were so bad. Um, your, your view is that actually, realistically, given the kind of ambitions, given the uh, irrealism of the ambitions, uh, it's very hard to imagine a scenario in which we actually could have successfully, even if you had some marginally right. larger number of troops or some marginally larger number of allies. Right. I mean, I mean, the case I, I make is that, you know, you wouldn't be able to accomplish the war aims that the administration had laid out. And that to some extent, I mean, the administration's sort of hawkish critics wanted even more ambitious war aims, you know, ra rather than less ambitious ones. And that th this just wasn't really feasible um, in this at least it wasn't possible to have any sort of likely prospects for success for doing this kind of thing. That, um, you know, I think you've even seen, as there's been a, a move over the past couple of years toward a more, I would say, orthodox, professionally endorsed um, counterinsurgency stability strategy in Iraq, that has involved, I think, at, at its at its more hopeful moments, a significant scaling back of the kind of ambitions for what the end state is supposed to be. Yeah, absolutely. Right, I mean, you know, once we get to the point where we're saying, you know, well, we're going to try to use our troops and use our money as leverage to cobble together some kind of coalition of existing, you know, political actors, that, that's a very different thing from, I remember in the, in the early months of the sort of post-war period, there was a, a Charles Krauthammer column in which... Um, he was deriding some scary uh, protests. That's now the, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq. They're, of course, um, you know, one of our major partners I in Iraq at the moment. And but also the, sort of uh, that was uh, Iranian, uh, sort of, or rather was certainly, you know, kind of very closely tied and continues to be closely tied with the Iranian government. Right, and particularly at, at that time was seen as 
they were kind of Iran's guys in Iraq, and we were supposed to develop, you know, our own guys, right? right. I mean, that that was the ambition. Now we've seen that um, exile-led you know, movements like the movement, uh, the Iraqi National Congress, etc. Right, right. Well, I mean, of course, Syria was itself well, also exile-led, exile-led led, but Western exile-led. It's, it's, it's just that we've we've tried to um, right. I mean, we're now trying to make deals with. Um, you know, anyone who's willing to make deals with us, yeah. which means you don't get to have sort of, you know, the partners of your choosing. It looks, I, I mean, it's very unlikely that you're going to turn uh, the ISCI party into, like, the lever by which you topple the Iranian government, which was a, a widely held sort of ambition at, at the beginning of the war. Um and, you know, so if, if you had tried to sell people in advance on the idea that we were going to overthrow Saddam Hussein's government in order to have a very sort of unsatisfactory, you know, ramshackle form of stability, the sort of thing we're aiming for now, of course you just wouldn't have invaded in the first place. I've certainly heard people talk about a Columbia scenario, a scenario in which actually large swaths of the country are not controlled by the central government in which you have a low-grade insurgency that continues for a very long time as being an actually pretty attractive outcome, uh, you know, given where we are right now in Iraq going forward. So, I mean, I think that speaks to your broad point that the right, goals right. have shifted, yeah. Right, and so and so that's the thing. I mean, I think it, it's correct to say that both both Bush personally, the administration, the country, ha- has learned a lot from the errors of the first several years, but I, the main thing we've learned, I think, isn't just that our tactics were wrong, but that our, our strategic strategic ambitions were, were far too broad. Um, you, you know, I mean, obviously there's a, a robust debate going on now about what forward-looking policy should be, but I think that even if you take the sort of the optimistic side of the forward-looking debate and project it backwards in time, what it mostly shows you is that, you know, we shouldn't have been so optimistic at the get-go. But, you know, broadly speaking, uh, one thing that I was struck by is, you know, given that you have a kind of rapier-like wit, uh, given that you are an orthodox thinker in a lot of ways, uh, Mm -hmm. you stress the point that actually uh, your effort is not primarily an effort about innovation for its own sake, but rather drawing on the best traditions of... uh, let's say, post-war American foreign policy. Would you say that's a fair characterization? Yeah, I mean, this is my, my, my you know, I, I think um, what, one thing that did occur to me as, as I was writing this book is to say, you know, well, like, what, why are you even qualified to, to write about this? Um, you know, and I, I think one of the things I could say on my behalf is I, I, I don't think that... The I am subs- enraged by the possibility enraged. that anyone could think to ask you such a question, Matt. Right, indeed. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think the substantive ideas I, I advance here are not terribly original. Um, it's, it's very derivative from um, the sort of orthodox, um, I think, you know, liberal in the international relations sense interpretation of the successes of American post-war foreign policy. Um, I think that, you know, a, a lot of that sort of Scholarship, a lot of that theory has been yeah, but you're offering a narrative in a very, in a very, um, right? I mean, in in a very inaccessible way, and also, you know, in a in a scholarly way, dealing with with the near past. I'm trying to, you know, take some of those ideas, apply them to contemporary political issues that people are interested in. um, You know, maybe uh, spice it up, hopefully, with the the occasional joke, fewer footnotes, um, some unsupported assertions. When is it? Did you have a revelation at one point that you know actually uh, because? I understand that you, like a lot of young people like myself, you know, were actually drawn at some point to the arguments of the liberal hawks, uh, particularly at the tail end of the 90s and even sort of, you know, going through the uh, run-up to the Iraq war to some extent. And was there a moment when you started to see these contradictions? Because, of course, a lot of the folks who advocated uh, our campaign in Kosovo and elsewhere Mm -hmm. actually saw this as a kind of extension of this broad post-war, you know, kind of, liberal internationalist consensus. No, I mean, I, I think that's true, and it's it's something I, I try to deal with in, in the book, and that I, you know, I mean, I wish I could um, could sort of read minds better, because it's a, a limited number of individuals who, who you're actually talking about who compose this trend. Uh, but definitely, you know, I had a kind of, um, I would say, sort of instinctive, almost tribal mm-hmm. allegiance to the more the more centrist element in the Democratic Party, which meant that you know I, I was overwhelmingly predisposed when this debate broke out to wind up you know on the side of Joe Biden and the New Republic and the Democratic Leadership Council versus uh, the the side of, of the left wing of the party. Um, but you know, I think one advantage that that I have and had as a sort of younger, underqualified person. Well, you were the editor of a newspaper financed by the CIA. Yeah. Uh, well, no. <laughs> I, I think at one point in time it may have been. Um, but you, you know, 
was that as this sort of disaster sort of was unfolding before my eyes, you know, I had a chance to think about it without having had a sort of long career of, of public pre-commitments. You know, I think I was the sort of person who, as a 17-year-old, um, was a, was super enthusiastic about the, the Kosovo War. But <laughs> no, no, nothing about my professional self-esteem or, or whatever was yeah. tied up in the argument that that was the greatest and most unimpeachable moment in, in American foreign policy. To me, as, as I say in the book, you know, I think when you look back at it in the overall context... Um, it was a very defensible sort of course of action, but that, you know, the people who were involved in it, people who for whom that war was a major turning point in their own career, either as practitioners or as people who sort of excommunicate other writers for being too left-wing, yeah. um, you know, wound up sort of, I think, over-idealizing. That sort of environment. It, and I think you'll see that, you know, a lot of the sort of big... Particularly given um, the many respects in which the Kosovo intervention was, in fact, an ugly failure. But no, I mean, exactly. I mean, you, yeah. you see very little sort of, of people um, looking back at that, it, it, particularly the people who were the loudest proponents of it, and, and even, you know, would go into 2003, 2004, 2005, talking about the wonders of this liberal humanitarian war tradition, but they would never write anything about Kosovo. Because that I hate Kosovo, it Kosovo itself yeah. has turned out to be, a, I think, a frustrating, um, you know, maybe you want to call it semi-success. Uh, yeah. Maybe you would want to be harsher, call it semi-failure. But, you know, it, it hasn't been, like, some great, glorious blossoming of democracy over there. Well, I just want to interrupt briefly just to say, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, this takes us a little bit off the track, but, you know, I know that you enjoy counterfactuals as much as the next guy. Sure. And, of course, you know, the Kosovo intervention grew out of this kind of long, torturous uh, involvement in the former Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. And there certainly was a sense, uh, you know, held by Democrats as well as Republicans, that it, it might have been wise for us to actually unilaterally break, for example, the arms embargo. And what we right. saw happen with the Bosniaks sort of in, you know, kind of uh, towards the tail end of the conflict, quote unquote, tail end of the conflict, um, as uh-huh. the parties, you know, kind of headed towards Dayton, that the Bosniaks uh, actually proved far more militarily inf- effective, in part because actually they were using arms uh, financed by the Saudis. Uh, right. They were leaning on the Iranians to some limited extent. They were uh, using arms in the Visegrad states, uh, you know, through various channels, uh, and, you know, again, they were actually starting to defeat uh, the Serbs sure. in the battlefield, but sure. had, for example, the United States actually said, you know, screw this, uh, the arms embargo is a broken policy that is disadvantaging the legitimate right. uh, government. How do you feel about that? I mean, had we actually taken that step? I mean, do you think that would have been uh, a dangerous nationalist departure from what you see as the kind of consensual... Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I haven't made a, a detailed study of, of that particular question. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's any super firm point of principle around the question of that arms embargo. Hmm. Uh, You know, I mean, I think if you look at uh, Bill Clinton's memoirs on it, you know, his own thinking on this subject was was tied up with sort of other parallel diplomatic concerns with other European allies. I mean, I think certainly in retrospect, one wishes that that kind of embargo hadn't been put in place in the first place. Um, You know, it seems to have been a a sort of a serious mistake there. Um, But, you know, I mean, I think there's a a difference, a pretty clear difference between selling weapons to the government of, you know, of recognized independent state um, and, uh, you know, launching a war. I mean, it's, it's just right. a difference in scale. Uh, wh- whatever principles may or may not be in play are, are at a much kind of lower level there. Um, but also, I mean, the, the whole disintegration of Yugoslavia was a an unusual situation. It posed an unusual kind of challenge for American security policy because of the way in which it implicated Europe, which has been sort of the core area of our alliances and so on and so forth. It it put pressures on us in a way that, you know, we of course haven't responded to civil war in the Congo, for example, with the same kind of robustness. In some ways, you know, people sometimes charge that as a kind of... um, as a kind of racism to say, you know, well, when, when there's problems that, you know, white people are having in southeastern Europe, we're very upset when there's yeah. problems in Africa, we don't care. By the same token, I mean, it's, it's really true that events, even in the European periphery, are more concerned to us than events in, in sub-Saharan Africa. In terms Africa. of refugee outflows and sort of other implications? And refugee outflows, I, yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, Italy, right, yeah. is hugely concerned by whether or not there are vast hordes of Albanian and Slovenian refugees pushing right. this way and that. Clearly, a and the nature collapse of, would engender a lot of kind of fretfulness in the United States. Right, yeah. right, right. And, you know, I mean, 
one thing that I think the U.S. government has done under both Clinton and Bush is try to sort of nudge uh, our allies in Europe to build somewhat more of their own capabilities to deal with these kind of problems because it, it creates a, a weird situation where we have us operating basically outside of our own backyard right. because it's in the backyard of our closest friends when those are in fact you know quite large and rich countries of their own that ought to be able to sort of manage small scale security problems in their own region. So prospectively speaking, I mean, in terms of the future evolution of the American role in the Indeed. liberal world order as you see it, uh, you like the idea of Japan and the you know kind of more affluent states of Western Europe evolving independent security capabilities so that they can actually manage their regions as they see fit in various ways. Would you say that's uh, that's about right? I mean, there's two kinds of things. Uh, for one thing, it would be nice to see more of the world's rich countries being able to participate in things like peacekeeping operations, so on and so forth. At the moment, an awful lot of the manpower provided for for those sort of blue helmet missions comes from uh, you know sort of developing world militaries. Right. That, that fact, don't have a, a ton of capabilities, um, you, you know, and it's it's great for for Bangladesh um, to to be so willing to be involved <laughs> in that. But you know, anytime those missions are effective, you tend to see um, Canadian or Scandinavian military units sort of involved at the core. Yeah, because those Bangladesh are, are pretty damn effective. But your point is well taken. Yeah, I mean, you know, they need yeah. and, and also, I mean, the, the Bangladeshi government requires external sources of finance right, right, to mount right. a lot of those things. Um, yeah, you know, it's the rich world has the resources, and you know, it would be good to see as many wealthy countries as possible sort of playing as large a role as possible, which is you know not in any way meant to sort of crowd out. The countries like Bangladesh that have tried to play a, a large role, they're sort of doing the best they can. Uh, also, you know, I mean, I do think, particularly in, in Europe, uh, Japan and China have, have their own sort of, uh, you know, thorny situation. But it's good to see, you know, sort of regional security organizations coming up. Yeah. I think the United States shouldn't be, you know, frightened about the emergence of regional security organizations around the world. Or a see that as, as excluding like us. That, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't think... We should imagine ourselves as involved in a sort of a zero-sum competition for power, particularly with other, you know, capitalist democracies. It's, yeah. You know, we, there's a pretty broadly shared common interest in doing something about certain kinds of problems of disorder around the world. One thing I admire about you very much is that, you know, you're able to step back from your role as an American, as an, uh, as an American public commentator, to, you know, put yourself in the shoes of another party. I recall having read a, a book by one of my old professors, Glenn Morgan, on the idea of a European superstate. And ah, his yes. argument is that, you know, the great strength of a European superstate is that it would have a level of independence and freedom of action in international affairs. Right. Uh, it would not be under the thumb of American power. I actually right. think this is a pretty kind of persuasive, coherent argument from a vantage point as a European. Uh, but, of course... I mean, you know, the idea is that if Europe and other sort of great powers uh -huh. have the capability to pursue more kind of independent action, doesn't it suggest that actually the kind of liberal world order that you have in mind, uh, you know, could be replaced by revived great power conflict? Is that something that concerns you? Uh, I mean, you know, you I, keep I, it consensual? I, I think, you know, I think we should be concerned about revived great power conflict. I think the idea of great power conflict between the United States and a more coherent, more independent European Union is, is a little hard to imagine. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I just don't... I mean, for one thing, I, 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 I met uh, Glenn Morgan uh, a few months ago, and I, I talked to him at some length about this. Um, but also, if, I mean, if you speak to any Europeans, it... For, it just seems very unlikely that that kind of really robust independent yeah. European uh, security policy will emerge. It also seems like if it does emerge, it would actually, U.S. prodding would be playing an important role in that rather than, um, y you know, it happening as a, as a hostile action. But I also just don't really know what our conflicts would be about yeah. exactly, y you know, what, what the substance of them would be. I think we should worry about um, the U.S. and China. I think you see trends on, on both the left and the right I I in the United States which might have us sort of stumbling backwards into a, a kind of conflictual, a hostile relationship with China that doesn't really serve either country's interests. Well, I think that we're 
we're both broadly on the same page about China, namely that China is a country that is quite poor, that is plagued by so many security challenges of its own, that it is a little silly of us to think of it as a grave threat. Uh, and yet, I, I think there might be a little bit of distance. In, mm-hmm. Well, in so far as I mean, I, I actually weirdly have a lot of empathy for the Chinese. When you see the actual sharp expansion of American military power, you see right. the extent to which it's actually along China's frontiers, uh, mm-hmm. It's particularly its western frontier, which is perhaps the most kind of uh, volatile part uh, from right. their perspective, uh, that actually they have you know pretty legitimate reason. Uh, and when people talk about their increased military budgets, etc., actually, you know, it's nowhere near where their military budgets were in the late 1970s uh, as a slice of the economy. If anything, uh-huh. they're actually just modernizing a kind of aging and sort of a, a force that actually isn't really capable. Well, and of, of course, their, their economy is growing enormously. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, when, yeah. If, when your country becomes much richer, you spend more money on, so you you think know, that, on all kinds of things. Do you think that we should try to kind of deepen engagement with the Chinese, uh, try to include them in sort of consultative frameworks and, I mean, and I, other I, I think it, bodies? I think, I think it's good to do that kind of thing. I think it's important to be... Um, I, I, this is, I think, the, the main way to put it. There's this sort of catchphrase all across the spectrum about China needs to be a, a responsible stakeholder um, in, in international institutions, uh, you know, which I think is a, is a good catchphrase. Um, but, you know, We should make sure when we're doing that that we recognize that part of expecting China to be a responsible stakeholder in international institutions is that China is going to expect the the rules of the game to adequately reflect China's interests and and China's point of view. And that, you know, we shouldn't just be saying, well, here we are, America, as the kind of um, rich uncle, here's the set of rules, you know, you you need to follow them all, um, you know, or it's it's going to be war or something which i don't think is what anyone quite means to do but 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 americans even sort of worldly um americans who who deal with international affairs can i think sometimes get very provincial in their um sort of outlook on, on these things and particularly you know just the fact that other countries have their own interests don't necessarily take american good intentions for granted as as an absolute thing so we yeah. should let to some extent you know whether or not we form security partnerships that include china be shaped by genuinely i mean does the chinese government want to do that you know or not i think we should be open to going sort of either way with that kind of thing that our main interest vis-a-vis china is as long as you know a they not do anything like really crazy, you know, start unprovoked, uh, you know, uh, yeah. wars of aggression, which doesn't seem like they're, you know, secretly plotting to do, but, you know, they, they have to not do. But then it's just to make sure that, you know, as they get richer and want to add capabilities and, and whatever, that, that doesn't become a, a dynamic where every instance of Chinese involvement in the world or American involvement in the world is seen by the other as some kind of threat. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I guess that there is a little bit of distance between our views uh, insofar as, I mean, I am concerned about the extent to which the Chinese uh, are trying to leverage economic power with states within the region, but of course that's their backyard. But one area where I think that actually the point you made regarding empathy, uh, simple empathy of American foreign policy, uh, relates to uh, two places that you've written a lot about mm-hmm. in your blog and elsewhere, uh, Pakistan and Turkey, uh, right. particularly kind of the fact that we were so utterly shocked that Turkey refused to, a democratic Turkish government refused to cooperate with uh-huh. us in the invasion, uh, despite the fact that, you know, during the last Gulf War, they were massively screwed uh, to the point where actually it led to kind of economic calamity for them, despite all kinds of promises made by uh, the first Bush administration. Mm-hmm, and similarly mm-hmm. in Pakistan, where, I mean, they had this very keen sense that they had been utterly abandoned. Now, for all of the skullduggery uh, and all of the kind of limitations of Pakistan's uh, Variously quasi democratic and quasi authoritarian governments. Um, it certainly seems that that's something that would engender a lot of resentment, and that's something that we kind of fail to understand. Uh, that said, I mean, you know, I mean, sort of, we clearly. Well, okay, let's talk about Iran because here's an area where I, I sure. think we, we we very strongly agree. Uh, I, I should say disagree. Disagree. Um, disagree. Now, Tell me a little bit about how you feel Iran fits into this framework of a kind of consensual liberal international order, given the fact that actually they they seem to behave very much like a classical 19th century great power, uh, wouldn't you say? 
Well, you know, I mean, I mean, Iran. I think there is something to the notion of Iran as a, as a rogue state uh, that, that that has been applied. Uh, but at the same time, th- there's a large extent to which I think U.S. Iranian conflict over the past, you know, not not over the Bush administration, but since the revolution in Iran, has been rooted in almost nothing but just a a self-sustaining cycle of hostilities where there's not a huge objective divergence of interests. And wouldn't you say that, I mean, Iran, I mean, even if you had mm -hmm. uh, an Iran that wasn't an Islamist state that actually by virtue of its place within the region and also by virtue of a lot of historical uh, and religious cleavages, though I'm actually generally very wary of this kind of argument from atavism, but that they would uh, seek uh, nuclear weapons and they would seek to have, you know, a lot of influence in the region. That would just I mean, entirely. certainly they would seek influence in the region. I mean, if you look at, at Iran under the Shah, I mean, yeah. they were very interested in being a sort of locally mighty military power. Um, with some interest in in nuclear weapons. But that's precisely why, actually, I think that some of the alarmist takes on Iran that that you see in in the American press are are misguided. I mean, Iran under the Shah was... um, as it turns out, was a very problematic ally for the United States, but was very much a country that, you know, we enjoyed a good relationship with. It, It was not the mere fact that his regime wanted a strong Iranian state, a strong Iranian military, and the ability to be an influential player in the immediate region was not deemed at that time as inimical to American interests, and I don't think it's inimical now. Now, of course, if Iran is both very hostile to the United States and seeking regional influence, that's bad for us. But insofar as the hostility is just built on a self-sustaining sense that, you know, we don't want Iran to be influential because they're anti-American, and Iran is anti-American because they're seeking influence and we're seeking to thwart them, that doesn't really make sense. It's not... It's not... I don't think we have a first-order interest in making Iran into a weak state. It just happens to be a a big country that a lot of people live in and that has natural resources. It will probably be an influential state among countries adjacent to Iran, uh, one way or the other. I like to think that I have a kind of nuanced view uh, on Iran, but it's certainly a lot closer to the neoconservatives you regularly excoriate, and, and, and yes. oftentimes deservedly so. You should say, to call me an Islamofascist. <laughs> well, an apologist. I, I would, for, they, I, they, 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 they like spice and, and conflict. On this, well, I mean, you do have uh, that thing, wonderful yeah. beard. Uh, and, sort of, and we've also commented on your uh, your resemblance to Ahmadinejad, uh, uh, you know, including your own sweet yeah. hipster style. But uh, I think that, you know, Iran wants nuclear power. That makes sense. They have this subsidized uh-huh. domestic oil price uh, and the international price is very different. They're actually really crappy at getting their oil out of the ground. That I actually understand. I think that people need to understand that better. I okay. also buy into the idea that actually offering them something, a very big prize, like full-on diplomatic recognition um, actually makes some sense. Having sort of very thoroughgoing uh, engagement with the Iranians mm-hmm, makes sense mm-hmm, as mm-hmm. a carrot, as an inducement. Um, the sense of where the Bush administration has failed with Iran is actually... Uh, but that raising the rhetorical temperature means that we actually aren't able to take any action without it being an extremely sweeping large-scale action. I mean, we have done things like tried to kidnap, you know, random IRGC guys, that uh-huh. kind of thing. But it, my sense is that actually, and, and this is a, an area where I know we disagree, that Iranian involvement in Iraq has been extremely substantial and has actually been very, very direct to the point where there are special operators who are acting in Iraq. My sense is also that, you know, it's true that uh, ISCI and sort of uh, other elements within the government uh, Mm -hmm, have received mm -hmm, Iranian mm -hmm. support, but that support is very different in kind from the kind of support that's gone to other Shia militias that are, you know, more robustly opposed to the central government and that the central government is increasingly taking on. Uh, and, And, of course, that the Iranians have actually also backed Sunnis sort of to varying degrees. Sure, but, but, but I, mean, I, I think the, the real issue here is not, I think, should we or should we not blame Iran for something or other or, or, or whatever in Iraq? It's, you know, it goes back to the, the first order question, which is what do we want out of our relationship yeah. with Iran, right? I think this whole thing, us fighting them in Iraq or not, or, you know, us trying to, sh- I mean, I, I think for one thing, to a large extent, the Bush administration having committed just a huge fiasco that shed vast quantities of blood, you know, likes the idea of sort of shifting responsibility for this onto the Iranians. But, but the larger point is that we have a real clear interest in making a deal with Iran that produces some kind of verifiable nuclear disarmament. 
whether or not some gang of dudes controls some neighborhood in Najaf, gets money or not from the IRGC, is basically, it's neither here nor there. It gets I money mean, and weapons, unless you and also accept. sort of very active training and assistance, right? I mean, uh, that's the claim, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't want to concede that any of that is true, because I think there's a good reason to assume that anything the administration is saying is probably false. But even if it is true, it, it just it doesn't matter. It's it's just it's bullshit, you know. And you know the pro- it's it's again it's mutually reinforcing. I mean, you say, well, you know, the Iranians are involved in activities that kill American troops, but so the troops need to be there as long as it takes to kill every single person who wants our troops to leave. You know, that's that's stupid. I think it, it's not a reason for us to be there, and it's not a reason to be locked into hostilities with Iran. The nuclear issue is a good reason to be worried about Iran, to have some some sticks and whatever that we're wielding against them. And it makes much more sense to try to focus in on that in a narrow way rather than have a, a sort of a broad-spectrum conflict with them about yeah, southern Iraq. it's interesting. I mean, and this, of course, is a, is a pretty profound disagreement. Uh, my own view is that, you know, just as you acknowledge uh, enthusiastically that the Bush administration is doing things that are sharply at odds with core American security interests, similarly, it seems possible to me at the very least that the Iranians are doing much the same thing and that actually they have a kind of very deep-seated, widely uh-huh. held ideology, uh, an ideology that, you know, kind of is variously popular and unpopular, but that certainly has access to a lot of power including the power of vigilantes on the street uh, to intimidate political opponents within the country, and that is also self-perpetuating, just as Hamas. Hamas isn't going to decide, you know something, we should have a Gandhian strategy of nonviolence, because of course Hamas, like any other group, wants to perpetuate itself, uh, just as the Democratic and Republican parties want to perpetuate themselves. Um, It just so happens that perpetuating themselves involves using real, ugly tactics, Uh, and, and the same goes for the Iranian state. You know, ergo, I mean, though I do agree with you that, broadly speaking, uh, you know, Iran is a state that has certain kind of core interests, some of those core interests are going to clash Mm -hmm. with our own, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't have some kind of condominium, some kind of accommodation. But it happens that we're dealing with elements within the so-called deep state uh, that actually might be irreconcilable, and that actually undermining them in various ways. But, but, I mean, but irreconcilable to what? I mean, I, I think if, if, if the Iranians want to undertake a, a quixotic effort to conquer Iraq, we should, uh, you know, wish them good <laughs> luck with that. I mean, not, not try to stop them. It's a, it's, it turns out to be hard. I, I think they've even done it in the past. And it, it didn't work so, out I mean, you're well. pretty sure that, uh, you know, kind of what I see as good news, uh, you know, when the central government is taking on, uh, you know, anti-government Shia militias, uh, when you see, you know, kind of the, uh-huh. the Sunni tribes actually saying that maybe the central government isn't, in fact, dominated by Persians, where you see some degree of low-level reconciliation, you don't see this as happening. You think that this is all shim-sham and that the Sunni tribes at any time, I mean, they're just accepting bribes, basically, and they're going to turn and, and sort of basically we're on the edge of chaos and that we haven't actually seen any political maturation. Is that... Well, you know, I think... Um the perspective of the, the Iraqi government vis-a-vis the, the, the Sadras and the government of Iran, I think some of the developments over the past couple of weeks are, are leading me to sort of reconsider uh, some of the things there. I don't really believe that the Sunni tribes have reconciled themselves to Shiite domination. On the other hand, you know, I, I don't want to say, right, Americans are very sort of can-do people. So there's a tendency to take, like, a giant waste of money and blood and treasure that's sort of killing American power and influence and tons and tons of people and reduce it to a question of whether or not our pointless strategy is working. Um, I am skeptical that it's working as well as its proponents say it is, but I don't think that's You just think that it's a senseless waste question. of time and I mean, resources they, regardless of whether or not we get some sort of somewhat better or decent outcome. I, I mean, I think, I think particularly when, when you understand it, you know, I mean, I, I sometimes talk to people um, who, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, mainstream but left of center types, you know, whatever, and they'll say to me, well, you know, Matt, just because the war was a bad idea from the get-go, you know, doesn't mean, you know, those sunk costs don't mean we shouldn't do more. And I do think people need to understand that the sort of decades-long American engagement in Reconstruction in Iraq that's implied by Petraeus' strategy and and his doctrine and so forth means that most of the costs are still to come. Oh no! That, you know, I, I mean, a, yeah, you're, you're talking you're about right, you're talking about extremely of the extensive yeah. engagement. I, I, I would be, 
you know, thrilled to, um, if there were some reason to think that the current strategy in Iraq were like nine months away from succeeding, to say, you know, I have my doubts, but fuck yeah. it, let's give it the nine months. But what we're saying is, is that, oh, it's working, it's working, it's working, and it's working so well that, you know, we only need 15 right. more years of this. And, and I think that's a, that's a little dumb. Frankly, and, and that you know, a strategy of cutting and running in the most irresponsible way imaginable, like in a way that involves us just like you know leaving yeah. heavy weapons behind, blah blah blah. That could produce stability in fifteen years. I mean, my, you, my you know, it's definitely knows? the dumb. It, it's view just that I think that we're there for the long view. <laughs> we're gotcha. there for the long haul, and that I mean, for example, you, you, know, you noted uh, Sam Stein's Huffington Post remarks concerning John McCain, which I actually thought were pretty telling because I think that uh-huh. you know what McCain has seen is sort of initially there was a sense, ah, uh, you know. This is a kind of uh, Arab and Kurdish population. This is not a place that's going to welcome a long-term American presence. But I think that, you know, kind of as sort of a lot, right. a lot of folks have noticed, I mean, given the nature of this, uh, Stephen Biddle made the argument incredibly brilliantly and well in Foreign Affairs a, a couple, uh, a little while back uh, in, I think it was called... Uh, you know, seeing Baghdad, thinking Saigon, just that given its nature as a communal civil war, the idea of uh-huh. having some American presence uh, for reassurance, um, you know, sort of, you know, given sort of the delicate balance and given sort of the right, sense right, of right, right, right. that any minority is going to have, you know, and the turn toward primary loyalties, I think that that's actually why the Yugoslavia case is actually pretty interesting and telling. I mean, there was, I believe it was Charles Boyd who argued in Foreign Affairs that, I mean, when you're looking at the Bosnia case, it's not so much that the Serbs are these horrible villains, and actually reading John Mueller, who is one of my favorite foreign policy analyst, and I think you like him too. Sure. Um, you know, just, I mean, the real dynamic wasn't actually one of genocidal violence. It was actually criminal violence. It was criminal brigandage that was, you know, ginned up by political entrepreneurs. Um, and I think that, you know, you see something similar happen when these political entrepreneurs also sort of create a kind of ethnic brigandage, ethnic mafias uh, that sort of, you know, lead to a lot of bloodshed and killing, and then you're going to have outside, you know, actors who are going to try to exploit this. To Look, the, the, this is what I'll say. If the United States hadn't invaded yeah. If Saddam's regime had crumbled through some, you, you know, more or less, you know, he dies, there's a coup, whatever, it falls apart, civil war breaks out, devolving sort of violence, factions, Which is actually blah, blah, not blah. a scenario that I find, that's actually the scenario that I find kind of likely, but... It oh, no, 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 I, I think, you know, I, I think that, that totally could have happened in, you know, 2011, or, you know, <laughs> when it, whenever it would have been. I, I could totally imagine a chaotic post-Saddam Iraq reaching a position where there's some kind of balance between the factions where bringing in an external force of of Americans or others um, was able to sort of help stabilize the situation. Um, You saw that in Bosnia. I mean, it's it's common for civil conflicts to end with some kind of third party involvement. Well, of course, the number of troops would have to be pretty large. I mean, depending on the nature of the violence. But I mean, you know, for well, example, I mean, having I mean, a counterterrorism mission or a training mission sure. well, without well, having I, a pretty big number of troops. Well, I mean, it, w- it would depend on, on what what exactly you were you were hoping for anyone to accomplish. But right, I mean, right, the, right. the the actual chronology of the situation in Iraq, of course, is that we invaded first, um, which I do think is relevant to how the situation is understood. <laughs> yeah, I think it's relevant, too. <laughs> by, 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 by Iraqi <laughs> actors and, and so on and so forth. And I don't think it's possible, really, for us to play the role of an that, honest broker. That kind of role as a neutral, honest broker, to be seen as playing that kind of role. Which isn't to say that we can't, in the long duration, succeed in creating some 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 kind of stability around a, a coalition of people who are who are willing to partner with us, but to some extent, you, you know, we are involved and our Iraqi allies are involved to some extent in fighting people purely because those people are opposed to our presence there. And this was a part of the story with with the Anbar awakening, of course, from from the get go, was that there was initially a, a Sunni insurgency that was targeted at us because you know they didn't want. American troops occupying their country over the course of years with some tactical shifts, some different things Al-Qaeda did, some different things we did, blah, 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 blah. We're now working with a lot of those same um, sort of armed Sunni bands. But the, the, the point was was that, you know, we are not a um, purely extrinsic factor to these Iraqi political conflicts, that things that began as purely anti-occupation things took on sectarian casts. Now the, the situation yeah, the is fact even that more we, complicated we than that. We see us broadly acting in good faith that we've been seeing, you know, sort of, and that, you know, kind of it takes time to build that trust with a lot of the local political elements that had been sort of on nationalist grounds opposing our presence. You know, that, that seems natural to me. 
No, I, I really think that, that that's a sort of a, a backwards reading of it. I mean, and among other things, we've become incredibly unpopular among Iraqi people. You know, in a way that has not, it's true, prevented um, the sort of quasi-elected I- Iraqi government from remaining dependent on our power. But it's fundamentally difficult to operate in this kind of environment where the population is very, very hostile. Although, I mean, again, I, I just want, want to reiterate that, you know, the feasibility or lack thereof of this kind of thing has, I think, a, a limited impact on the question of whether or not it's actually a good idea. I mean, yeah. there are any number of countries where, in principle, 130,000 American troops and $120 billion a year could help ameliorate some aspects of some humanitarian problems um, that, y- you know, that's not to say it's a it's a good thing to be doing. Have you read Parag Khanna's uh, book, The Second World, by any chance? I have given it a sort of you know blogger skim. <laughs> you know, it's an. I actually think it's it's a really neat book. Uh, I wasn't expecting it to be as persuasive as I as I ultimately found it. I, I, there was one point where you were talking about the United States role uh, in I think it was Thailand and also in the Philippines, where you know you have these pretty big. Uh, Muslim insurgencies, yeah. sometimes that have an Islamist coloration, sometimes that don't. And we've been supporting the governments, also in the case of uh, Ethiopia's action against the Islamic Court's government. Yeah, uh, I, may, I, may, I may be wrong, particularly about the Philippines, what I say in the book. Well, it's interesting because I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about my, you know, just biographically about you uh-huh. know, my own views and uh, how they've evolved over these broad foreign policy questions. And I remember thinking at one point, look, the war on terrorism, this doesn't make sense. This isn't a very smart framework. This isn't mm-hmm. what this mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, in democratic politics, I mean, Thomas Christensen had that great book, Useful Adversaries. In democratic politics, oftentimes you need over-mobilization to get the resources that you need, uh, you know, to... Uh, pursue some kind of broadly responsible course. Uh-huh. This is a danger of democratic politics because, you know, of course, the other side is listening to your debates, to your uh-huh. discourse. Uh-huh. Uh, but regardless, that the war on terror as a framework could be used to deal with what is a real, genuine, and, and very expensive problem, namely the stateness problem, or the lack thereof in large swaths of the world. Yes, And the I idea that it true. makes sense for us to help thicken and strengthen... Uh, I think, I, I think, I think it world. does make sense for, for the United States and other countries with available resources to try to do that. I, I do think, though, that we need to be a lot lot more sensitive than the Bush administration has been to the sense that in every single political conflict around the world well, that involves a Muslim population having some kind of dispute with a non-Muslim government, that we are taking sides in the armed suppression of the Muslim side of that dispute. Um, you, you know, I, I think there's a, a good deal of... Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a coincidence. I, there, there's a historical reason for, for, for this kind of thing. But, um, you know, S- Samuel Huntington has, has this notion of, of Islam's bloody borders um, that, that, that he develops. Yeah. And, and, and you don't want a sort of a commitment to trying to improve governance and reduce state failure to look like a, just a sort of organized conspiracy against uh Muslim political movements all around the world. You, you know what I mean? I, I don't think at all that that's, you know, w- what we are doing. If you look, I, I believe that policymakers see what we're doing in the Philippines as very continuous with what's happening in Colombia, say. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it is important to recognize those kind of realities. It's very important that we not endlessly be in a dynamic where this new huge generation of, of youngish Muslim people has, you know, 70, 80 percent negative views of the United States. And we need to, I think, try to show that our involvement in some of these conflicts that involve Islamic and non-Islamic people is actually delivering um, something that's helpful to, to Muslims. I have a couple of quick questions for you. One mm-hmm. is, uh, you note the Mueller factoid that uh, international terrorism has in fact killed fewer Americans than peanut allergies. Yes. Why does this not incline you to take a hardline stance against peanuts. Against uh, peanuts. You know, having, I mean, I know that you're not a kind of Jimmy Carter Democrat, and no. it seems to me that peanuts are actually a, a broad indicator of the uh, of the kind of precipitous cultural decline uh, in this country. Peanut butter makes people fat. The, pe- the peanut slothful. threat is all too real. No, I actually am in a sort of, uh, as uh, Jonah Goldberg might put it, a uh, liberal fascist uh, mindset, and, and actually think there should be much, much more public policy emphasis on these kind of lifestyle-induced public health problems, and, and probably less on health care per se, as as an issue, um, 
Yeah, so you know, we'll, we'll war, right war, on, war, war on food again. allergies. Um, other, but you know, there's a, there's some scientific issues there. Oh, how do you mean? Well, I mean, I, I believe for for somewhat mysterious reasons, the incidence of food allergies is on the rise in America. There's a restaurant in Washington D.C. in the Washington area, and it has a few outlets elsewhere called Five Guys. Five Guys and, has found uh, it's gone nationwide, hasn't oh, it? Oh yeah, well here they have one in New York now, which with is their very deadly, accurate. deadly peanuts. It's on St. Mark's. Oh, place, it's very dangerous, which is a little outrageous. Fear the peanut shells. They say yes. don't throw the peanut shells. Don't throw the peanut shells. I was on shells. a plane a couple of days ago, and uh, it was peanuts. announced that a woman had a nut allergy. Ergo, I couldn't eat nuts. I eat almost exclusively nuts, much like a raccoon. This was very upsetting to me, and I wanted to take action against that woman, but then it occurred to me, you know what, that's wrong. Um, I wanted to ask you another uh, quick question. Oh, All okay, right. okay. Well, well in that case, actually, well, why, don't you, well, why don't you actually throw something out there in that case? Throw something out there. You're throwing what, out there. Well, first of all, I just there. want to remind everyone uh, watching this. Yeah. Uh, I should say, yes, the pretext for this is my new book, <laughs> Heads in the Sand, available for sale at a finer bookstores near you, uh, also on the, the internet bookselling outlets. Um, it's all about, you know, why, um, you know, Bush is, is bunk. And, uh, no, it's, it's about why we need, I think, a, a serious, more principled, um, more coherent, a real alternative to the sort of foreign policy. That's As someone who country. disagrees with Matt a lot on these foreign policy issues, I really, yeah. really urge yeah. you to read this book. It is an incredibly lucid uh, treatment of a lot of very complex vexing issues. It deals actually with a lot of sophisticated normative concepts as well and weaves them into a com- you know, if you've been sort of completely knocked out for five years, you're going to need you're going to know everything you need to know after reading this. If you've been following everything avidly, you read the newspaper, you're an ink-stained wretch, you're still going to get a, a massive amount tons, of the trend tons. analysis. Ink-stained wretches, buy it. Um, and I'll say, Raihan's book, it's also brilliant, but you can't buy it yet, so I won't It's called Raihan on Raihan, uh, and it's all all about sort of the cocoa butter solution that I use on my shaved head. Um, well, it's delicious. <laughs> thanks so much, Matt. Uh, I really thank enjoyed you, this. Thank you. Um, all right. All right, man. Let's uh, let's hit the stop. Talk to you later. Bye.